then streaming. Okay, so just gonna wait a few seconds here and then I'm gonna get going. Are you guys ready? Yeah. All right. Like we're starting an NBA game. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to welcome those of you in the room and also those who are watching us online. My name is Selvin Ortiz, and the topic today is the case for uh, VS Code. So um, what I'm hoping to get out of this uh, Hangout is for us to be able to learn a little bit about what's made uh, VS Code so successful and uh, what's made it a go-to tool for uh, some of us that have been uh, working with Sublime Text, Atom, or Equivalent for uh, in the past. So uh, additionally, I would, like to, uh, I would like to find out where VS Code is going and some of the things that the team is focusing on. And uh, for that, we have uh, Wade Anderson from uh, Microsoft to kind of give us a little bit of uh, an insight into that. And uh, uh, with that, I'm going to let Wade introduce himself. So, uh, Wade, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks, Selvin. Um, so, I'm a, my, my name is Wade Anderson. I work as a PM on the Visual Studio Code team. I've been on the team for a year and a half. Um, we're pretty young products, so that's over uh, probably 70% of the total time the product's been around. Um, and uh, I like uh, sports a lot. It's one of my favorite hobbies, sports uh, and uh, startups. Okay. What kind of sports? Um, I'm really into baseball and okay. golf. Um, okay. And lately I've been into the NBA, although it's been a lot of blowouts this season. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's your handicap? Um, so I played golf in high school. I oh, was okay. a scratch golfer. Oh, um, wow. I, had, I had a two-year-old son. Um two years ago <laughs> and I uh, haven't played near as much as I'd like to. I, I'm probably at least a dozen handicap right now. That's fantastic. I worked at a, I worked at a golf club um, before I became a programmer. I worked in the, in, in the restaurant industry. This was like, you know, eight or 10 years ago. And I got to uh, I got to work at a uh, uh, golf club and I got to golf a lot. I was able to bring my handicap to 12, but that, that was as, as good as I could do because, <laughs> man, it's, it's, it's a tough, it's a, it can be a tough game. Yeah, um, you know, when you're in high school, I was playing like 12 hours a day every day. It was so fun. So you got to play a lot and you get pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, uh, let's take a quick pause here. I'm getting a chat from someone mentioning something about YouTube. Uh, still waiting. Uh, most likely it's still... Uh, uh, John. Oh, that was you, John. That was me. Yeah, okay. I, I I invited a friend to join, but he's asking why it's still waiting on YouTube. So I thought okay. I would mention it. Sure, we're uh, we're going to be broadcasting at 1080p, so most likely it's going to be taking a little bit of time. Um, okay. And feel free to interject, John, if you if you're on, just pop okay. in and yeah. So we're gonna we like to have it kind of relaxed in here. So uh, very good. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Wade, you mentioned that you had a you had a, a boy. Uh, is that the extent of your family? Just uh, uh, one boy at the uh, right now? Yeah, yeah. So I'm married and I have a two year old son. Okay. Yeah, that's very cool. I have a 16 month old that is extremely busy. Man, he. It's like I'm so I'm so happy that we actually we actually uh, have a house that's about five minutes from the big city but far enough away that we get to have like a huge backyard that you know oh, where man. we have a swing a tent and and little pool for him to play but yeah he's he's a busy boy <laughs> what's your boy's name his name is desmond desmond that's a cool name my, yeah, it's my good name. tv show lost what's that have you seen the tv show lost I have a few a few episodes, but I haven't really got into it very much. We got the name from one of the characters. Come on, the show. man! <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> no, that's that's yeah. cool. I just like the I don't love the character, but right. I like. The character. Yeah, my yeah. Uh, my boy's name is Silas, and we pick. Uh, I don't know what you guys kind of went through when you were picking a name, but my wife and I decided we're gonna do it tomorrow, and uh, we have we had our ideas right, and we just. Kind of, you know, I started writing a bunch of names and then uh, we said the name Silas and it just pretty, you know, it stuck around like that's, yeah, that's we decided cool. then and then we never revisited. So that was really cool. <laughs> um, 
And uh, can you tell us about your uh, your uh, college experience? Because I know I've seen you uh, uh, in some of the some of the presentations or the conferences that you've attended, uh, or, the, or I guess you've you've uh, you've done some presentations with VS Code, and uh, you're, you've been wearing your hat, or you've been talking about uh, uh, I don't know if it's OYU or a competing school. Yeah, it's a BYU. Oh, BYU. So, okay. It's uh, uh, in Provo, Utah. I grew I grew up in Utah. Grew grew up a Mormon in Utah, and um, so went, went to BYU as computer science major, and then I did a startup for two years out of school with some friends Okay. before joining the VS Code team. Very cool. And can you tell us a little bit about that, you know, getting, uh, getting involved with uh, uh, VS Code and, and yeah. uh, where you started, uh, what your role is now? Yeah, so um, the, the discussion about my son and the startups uh, go hand in hand. So when... When my son was born, we was looking, it's just a crazy lifestyle doing a startup. And so I wanted a little more stability. So I had some friends here at Microsoft and contacted them and they put me in touch with the VS Code team. Um, VS Code had launched just um, in May. Um, so it had been around about six months. Um, and I joined the team. When I joined the team in Redmond, there was only a couple of us. There was two other PMs. I was the third PM. And then we had one engineer um, were here in Redmond. Uh, and so we, most of the team was still in Zurich. Uh, oh, and we also had a, a designer and a documentation guy that would uh, do a lot of work uh, for VS Code as well. But relatively small team here in Redmond. Um, we've since grown. We have, um, what, what, seven or eight engineers now in Redmond. So we've about doubled in size. Okay. Um, the year and a half I've been here. Sure. Um, so when I started on the team, uh, we're, we're 3 PMs to roughly 16, 17 engineers. Um, and a lot of what I've been focused on has been for the extension experience with VS Code. So around the marketplace and the extension ecosystem. Okay. Um, and then other things to build community and evangelize VS Code um, and really think about how can we make VS Code more appealing to people that use other tools. Gotcha. How, uh, um, how, how big is that? How big is the team right now? 16 engineers ish. Um, okay. I don't count them all the time, but sure. that's roughly, and then uh, three PMs. Um, and then we have a person that manages all our documentation. Okay. Gotcha. Um, how and a marketer <laughs> can't forget the marketer. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. Uh, how, how easy is it to communicate with, uh, you know, with, uh, uh I'm, I'm assuming you guys are somewhat distributed, right? Yeah, yeah. So half the team is in Switzerland, mm -hmm. um, and they uh, uh, it's not too bad. Sometimes it's hard to find. We have like a two hour overlap of our days, early morning for us, late in the uh, late in the afternoon for them. Okay. Um, so sometimes it's hard to find meeting slots, but uh, we like we think of it in a positive way. We have like almost twenty four hour coverage of we're always on GitHub, we're always on Twitter, we're always watching things. So. Um, it, there's very little amount of hours that we don't have our full team or half our team available. Gotcha. Wait, I yeah. have a qu question for you. Um, yeah. So what's interesting to me, you said you have 16 engineers, you've got like three PMs, you have a marketer, but when I download this, it's free. <laughs> <laughs> it it get, makes me ask the question, like, is there going to be a pro version? Like what, what's the, the end goal? And I'll throw one out there that I think may be the case is, I've been on a Mac for a long time using Mac tools, and now I'm suddenly got a Microsoft product used for development. So that's my guess, but I wanted to hear what your reaction would be or your answer would be. Yeah. So when when I was joining the team, what was pitched to me is, hey, come work on a product where we want to build goodwill for developers. Like we we recognize there's this this whole uh, group of developers that we haven't engaged with. They're not on the .NET stack. They don't use Azure. Um, we want to build something that works well for them and really just gives us a platform to have more conversations and understand, hey, like you, John, you use a Mac. Um, traditionally, Microsoft, our, our, our research arm, our UX, we, we don't understand very well what your needs are as a developer. So VS Code gives Microsoft, the parent company, a good platform of, hey, what can we do in the future in, in three years from now as we're thinking or next year, two years, three years is we're developing more products. Is there something we can build for you based on what we learned from your interactions with VS Code? Really in conversations like these on Twitter, on GitHub, those are all the conversations we like to have. 
So it's kind of a fun mission that way. It's a good, it's a developer goodwill mission and it's a let's engage with the community mission. Great question, John. Um, we, since we kind of already started on, on, on uh, talking specifically about uh, VS Code and asking some questions regarding uh, VS Code itself, and the management around it, I kind of want to uh, I want to expand a little bit on that because it's a point of fear, I believe, the fact that VS Code is a Microsoft product. Not only that, but it seems to be a turn off for a lot of people. Um, and you are very involved uh, in the community; like you are not inside of the bubble, right? The problem the, the, the problem a lot of the times is that these products uh, are made in somewhat you know what what a few people think, you know, what a good editor should be and not getting a lot of input from people. But um, because I know you've been, you know, you're, you're uh, um, in, in, in other uh, conversations that you and I have had, you mentioned you're like a customer advocate for, uh, for VS Code, uh, which means that you're constantly reaching out to customers and, and, and working with them and uh, trying to figure out what features uh, need to make it into the product, et cetera. Do you feel like when you have these interactions or when you talk to people at conferences or you just meet someone for coffee or in general, when you interact with somebody, do they, do, do, do they get kind of this, um, you know, uh, it's a Microsoft product, they're going to kill it eventually. Uh, do you get that? Uh, is that or is that not really a big thing that you're exposed to? You know, I, I think especially early on, that was a, a larger fear um, and definitely this, I mean, you can imagine there was a large sediment um, in the, in certain communities that was negative towards Microsoft. Um, and one thing that we tracked um, with, that was, if you could call it our KPI was, um, can we change that sediment? Can we, in those communities that have traditionally been negative towards Microsoft, can we make them at least say positive things about some of our products like VS Code or TypeScript? Those are probably the two that have been able to make good headways into some of these traditionally more negative communities towards Microsoft. So, so that's been an important part. And that's definitely an important part of, of my job as a PM. It's, it's the entire team. I mean, we, we're, we're a unique team at Microsoft in that Every developer is really engaged with customers on a daily basis through GitHub, through Twitter, through Stack Overflow. These channels, where basically where our customers are right now is where we want to be as well. Gotcha. I don't know if that answers your question fully, but happy to extrapolate more. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's working, actually, at least from my individual point of view. Like I have uh, more respect for Microsoft than I have in years. I mean, and not just from VC code, but like the focus on the end user, like the experience through the office apps and stuff like that. So I do think it's working. Yeah. But my, sure. my fear is what Selvin mentioned is like, don't abandon, you know, like don't get, get us tied in and then mm -hmm. abandon it. That, that would be, it would almost be more detrimental. Like if you like killed off sublime text and then left us without any tool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think that's not anything that any of us want. It, it would be a horrible way to take <laughs> goodwill we built and turn it <laughs> yes. so, yeah and that's um, you know one yeah. uh, one one thing that uh, one thing i don't know if uh, um if uh, anybody watching is familiar with uh wade or follows him on medium but he wrote a really good article on uh, product ownership and from conversations that i've had with him it seems like that's a big part of vs code at this point which is i mean that's a big piece right like like being able to own whatever you're you're doing yeah, you can you can see it a lot. If if you read our release notes, we we're we try to have a hundred percent transparency of how we're making product decisions. Um, so let let me give you a couple of things we do. Every we we publish our roadmap on GitHub. Hey, this is what we're focused on from like a high theme level. And then every month we plan that month and we we put here's the issue, here's the engineer working on it. So you can see really clearly what we're planning on getting in the month. And then at the end of the month, we'll publish a very detailed release notes. Um, and some people have said, I can't believe you guys invest all this time. And it does take a lot of time, but it's part of our, we want to be transparent. We want to show how we're making decisions and what we're delivering. And this, the release notes you're going to see here in a few days, um, and Selvin, you and I have talked about this, this specific issue a couple of times, is um, the multiple folders and or workspaces within VS Code. So other products like Adam Sublime Text, have this feature where you can add folders A, B, and C, even if they don't share the same parent root, 
you can add them to the same workspace. And we've heard from the, like we've, we've felt this, hey, we want this, the community wants this. Well, in the release notes, you, you'll be able to see how are we making a decision on how we build this feature. We actually did two usability studies. We posted it on YouTube and how we tested the concept, the things we were thinking people would want. And you, the links will be in the release notes. So you can check those out yourselves and see, hey, this is how they're thinking about. And then we'll publish. This is where we're going to go. Really trying to engage our customers in every step of the process and showing how, how we're making decisions, but also getting feedback because that's how we believe a good product is made. That's that's fantastic. Uh, that, that's really great. Let, let that will be useful for me too. I know that's a feature I'm looking for. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so this well, you can provide us feedback then, John. We'll be happy to take. Yeah. <laughs> so taking a taking a step back, uh, taking a step back a little bit, and kind of uh, zooming out to look at uh, what code is right now and what the culture is behind uh, code. What do you think you're doing well to ensure that uh, VS Code remains lightweight and focused? Um, and to to continue that trend in the future, but at the same time, make sure that you um, work on worthwhile or meaningful features to uh, stay on top of modern web development. Yeah, that, that's a great question, um, and one we can't we can't stop asking ourselves is how can we stay focused on these core priorities and principles? Um, what what the product development philosophy we've taken with VS Code is we we established a set of principles that we felt like would make a good developing ex development experience. And, and the team has an incredible amount of developer tools experience. So let me give you a couple. Uh, Chris Diaz, who's a principal PM on the team, he worked years ago on the very, the very early versions of Visual Basic. So he's been working oh, wow. in controlling for years and years. Um, been, he's a 20 year Microsoft guy. And Eric Gama, um, who's the lead, the l engineering lead and is a technical fellow at Microsoft. Um, he, he runs the VS Code engineering team um, and he was a co-founder of Eclipse. So way back when he built, he, his team was the one that built Eclipse. So a lot of deep experience in this space. And when VS Code, when we started this project and this product, we said, okay, what, what's going to be important to developers? What do we want to do here? And you can think of, we, we looked at the developer tool space and we said, okay, on the one hand, you have all these customers that love um, Sublime Text, Atom, it, like these developer tools, they were great for a, a large segment of developers. And to be honest, I was, I've been a Sublime Text user for years. Like I love Sublime Text, um, just loved how fast it was. It really was a helpful tool for me. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the IDE users. You have people that love tools like Eclipse, like Visual Studio, IntelliJ, all really good tools. Well, our philosophy was we wanted to plug in, a, um, we wanted to fit somewhere in the middle. We felt like there was something missing where, um, and I, I felt this too, and if you watch one of my um, conference talks, I kind of explain my, how did I find the perfect developer tool? And it's, I wanted the speed of Sublime Text, the lightweight nature, but I still miss some things from, I call it IDE land, some right. things that, especially when I was learning how to code, um, I missed uh, IntelliSense features. I missed this like easy command click navigation throughout files. I missed a, a debugger that I could just set a breakpoint and hit play and then hit the breakpoint. Um, so what we've tried to do with VS Code is land right there with, with, a, with trending towards the text editors um, but still kind of cherry pick some of these best features from IDE land. Um, so with those principles in place, we, we've, we've moved forward and we try to put our, when we say, should we bring this feature in? Should we not bring this feature in? We run it through that lens. How can we remain a lightweight text editor while keeping the best from IDE land? Um, so it, it really comes down to every level of whether we're making product decisions or down to the implementation details. So when we face a trade-off of, okay, we can either do this and it'll make it a little bit slower or it'll add this, this feature that people want, we will tend to choose that we, we won't do it because we don't want to slow down the editor. So, so that's one of the principles is we will prefer speed over more features. And now there's ways we can get around that. We try to get creative, split things off into their own processes, really become very modular and Hey, you can just add extensions. You want to blow up the product? Just like add as many as you can, right? right? And that will work fine for someone. Now, we've also tried to control that by making the extension 
um, the extensions in their own extension host, um, which will uh, not mess with the rendering engine or anything like that. So that I, that's the, my attempt to answer your question. We, we try to stay principle based and stick to our vision for the product um, as we move forward. Cause as with any product uh, feature creep uh, feature bloat, those are going to be constant problems as you start to mature. And even as you start to listen to customers, this is like the trick with product development, right? <laughs> the more you listen to customers, um, the more they're just going to want more and more. Yeah. So it, this is really our jobs as product creators is we need to be able to get down into the, and this is how we approach the multiple folders. We didn't just, oh, you get, everyone wants multiple folders. Okay, let's throw those, throw that feature in. We spent a lot of time really kind of slowed down and said, okay, what is it, what's the core of what people want here and how can we do it in the right way? Um, so that's, I think, I think a good thing here is we just, we don't just add features because people want them, but we try to get at what is the deep thing that people really want here and how can we do it the best way in VS Code? Fantastic. I think that's a great answer and it definitely covers a lot of the basics that you touched on your um, well put together talk, if I may add. It's actually linked on the event page if anybody's interested in, 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 in watching Wade uh, tell us a little bit more about um, what he wanted to uh, accomplish with, with VS Code, but I think it's a great summary. And uh, as you were talking about some of these things, uh, one of the things that I wasn't aware is that uh, extensions run independently, or you mentioned they're at their own uh, host. Does that mean that they run in their own isolated process? Yeah, that's okay. correct. And they run in the process, yeah. Gotcha. Um, is this... Um, we work, I think, uh, a lot of us in the community, uh, Craft CMS community, as well as the PHP community in, uh, at large, we work uh, with uh, PHP, and we found that with VS Code, we get a lot of really cool stuff uh, out of some of the extensions that are already out there. Um, but, but out of the gate, VS Code does not provide any kind of PHP specific stuff. And you, it seems like you guys kind of decided to, you have this concept of language servers. Um, and uh, can you can you tell me a little bit about that? Because I'm guessing. Uh, actually, I don't want to guess. I'll, I'll let you answer. Yeah. So so because we're a small team, we had to choose a focus, and our focus was on is on uh, the JavaScript TypeScript experience. Um, so we. We, 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 that's a, that's our beachhead. That's kind of where we start. We'll, we'll, if we're going to build a new language feature, we start, we build it ourselves with JavaScript. Um, and then we enable it for other languages. And what we've been, what we've done with other languages um, is they, we've enabled the language service API. And there's a really thorough documentation on our website of how to build a language service. Um, we enable that for, any language. So anything you can do in JavaScript and VS Code, you in theory could do with any other language provided the extension provides that functionality. Um, and because so because we're a small team, we had to set a focus. And then within Microsoft, some teams have provided language services. Um, um, and then we have uh, either the community has built it um, and then we support some of these big ones. So like the Python extension, for example, mm -hmm. is built by a guy in the community. Um, and we actually hired him for a few months just to continue to work on it, sure. to prioritize it. Um, and then the PHP, for example, um, that uh, uh, Felix is working on that in the community. And we um, are providing him support as well. So we have one engineer that works with Felix to kind of like, hey, what, what can we make this easier? Can we help you with your extension? Um, uh, Go is another example. Uh, that one we also will add development to. So to, the idea is that we start with JavaScript and then we enable these other extensions. And each of them we have a different strategy for. I mean, in a perfect world for us, different people will just own them and we'll just right. kind of them because um, that makes it easy for us to stay relatively a lightweight team. Um, we can just help these partners, these third party or first party partners, first party meaning other Microsoft teams. Um, and uh, it's a good way for us to scale our how do we make an editor for people that use dozens and dozens of different languages so that it was uh, basically a, an implementation strategy we took with our extension API with our extension API. Um, and I think looking back, it was it was a great way to do it. It really makes it so 
um, we can we can scale our product without having to scale the amount of people on our team um, accordingly. Fantastic, and I think that's great. And this goes. Uh, I kind of want to point this out because I found it really interesting when when uh, uh, when you you and I were talking about it, and I heard you say this, um, and, and it kind of took me back a little bit. I mean, it makes sense. But um, just like you support people in the community and you mentioned you hire someone to work on the Python extension, you've actually also hired uh, 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 people straight up from the community to actually be part of the team. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Daniel, um, I'm on our team. Uh, if you follow us on GitHub, you'll see he's done a lot of work. He built the integrated terminal is kind of his big feature he's added to the That's product. That's one of my favorite features. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was when he joined the team, he's like, I got I really want to get this done. Um, but yeah, he was one of, he was the biggest contributor to VS Code. Um, and I actually don't know like whether he contacted us. I, I don't know how we actually got in contact with him, but we, um, we always joke that when we hired him, it made our amount of community contributions go way down because Daniel was contributing. <laughs> no, it's uh, I, I've joked with others too. If if they're interested in the VS Code team, just get involved in the project, and we we really value people's um, people adding stuff, um, and and it, it helps us to develop a developer relationship. Um, with people even when they're not on the team so it's a cool thing no that's that, yeah that's fantastic I, I thought i mean when you want to when you want to have a culture that is driven by uh, other people in the community because one of the things that i come to sort of um, learn after working in the in web development for a long time is that the editor or ide wh whichever one you you're more comfortable working in sometimes both becomes such a huge part of what you do. I mean, literally, it's the thing that I seem to hang out uh, with the most. I mean, I spend a ton of time, uh, and I do that for work. I do that uh, for side projects. I do that when I'm on the weekend, you know, hacking late night. Like, you're just working on, you know, it's, it's your primary tool. So it's a very personal thing. And uh, another thing that I sort of, uh, it, it's almost like a well-known thing that as developers, a lot of us, especially some of us that are kind of a, you know OCD a little bit, we want to control. We want to we want to control everything from you know from can I open um, can I open editors you know vertically uh, horizontally uh, the font rendering does it support ligatures um, you know can I have the right theme can I modify the theme the it's like we are pretty much obsessed with being able to uh, bend it to our will right um, and it seems like the general perception is that you should be able to do that even more so with editors than than with an IDE, right? Because if yeah. you're using an IDE, a lot of the times it's almost like you're okay if you cannot really customize everything because of all the other stuff that it's giving you. But knowing this uh, sort of made me look at VS Code and, and how quickly it was catching up to, say, Sublime or Atom. And recently, uh, you guys started allowing the panels to be customized as well, right? which was yeah. a, a huge thing because I was really excited about being able to customize all that kind of stuff. But to that end, is editor customization an important part of your, uh, uh, your planning and uh, your future roadmap? Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And I, I don't know if we directly call it out in the roadmap, um, but th this is the strategy we've taken with editor customization is when we so when we launched the product we we didn't have an extension story we we knew we were going to get there but following like a, i don't know the lean startup ideals of the day we wanted to get out, <laughs> be out there and see if people even bought on um so what we the the principles we took with developing extensions or uh, enabling extensions to build things is we wanted to provide um we, we wanted to be slow in rolling it out because we wanted to make sure we did it right. Um, we did it right by performance. We did it right by um, usability and consistency across user with users installing extensions. We didn't want um, there to be extensions in the ecosystem that you install and they just broke and they never worked or they caused problems to your editor. So we were very slow in starting to roll out features. This is 
this is maybe a philosophical difference that VS Code has as compared to Atom. Um, and we, we, we're fans of Atom here, but the difference they took is they're a very hackable editor. Uh, anything right. you want to do, they want to enable you to right. do it. <laughs> We're, VS Code is different. We're gonna we're gonna be a lot slower in enabling these customizations. Um, oh, but Adam's we, slow. <laughs> oh, wait, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Easy. We're, we're gonna, a joke. We're, we're a joke. gonna. Sorry. We're gonna. Yeah. We're, we're gonna be slower in enabling the customizations, but over time, ah, okay. you'll see. You'll you'll see <laughs> you'll see more and more of them come in because we we want to do it right right by performance and right by consistency are probably the two yeah. things to think about there. Yeah. Sorry about that. That was a joke. I, you just you just <laughs> opened it up. I had to take it. So, <laughs> no, and, and you know, it, it's it's a good. I, I think you queued it up there really well, John, because I think I've said it too many times in the community, right? Or and and um, I try to be very sensitive to people's choice because it's really important. You know, at the end of the day, uh, it comes down to preference. So if you yeah. prefer to work with Sublime Text um, and the, the, somebody else's preferred tool has a couple of things that are, that are better, um, as far as you know, then it, it might not make sense, right? Maybe there isn't enough to move up to that tool and maybe you are a lot more proficient in the tool that you're working with. So to me, um, like I try to be sensitive to that, but at the same time, you kind of have to be realistic between you know what X, Y, or Z have to offer and how it can improve your workflow. So for me, yeah. I think that you know I have a souped up iMac as my primary uh, daily driver, right? But I found Atom uh, compare you know it, it, compared to Sublime Text, which is written C plus plus and obviously takes advantage of other things, um, much more slow. Um, and I think not just in boot up time, but uh, in a lot of other things where responsiveness is important, right? If I open a file, I want it to open like snappy and just keep moving around, you know, search, like fuzzy search or whatever, because the features are there. But uh, I'm one of those people that works a lot from the keyboard. And I want to be able to just, I, I you know, I, I memorize these keyboards uh, shortcuts because I want to move quickly through different tasks. So to me, Adam may not necessarily have been slow to boot up or whatever, but not as responsive as I would like uh, it to be. Now, when, so under the hood, oh, sorry. So. Yeah, so, so when VS Code came around, that was my first, you know, I'm I'm working with Sublime Text because to be honest, and I think you know for anybody watching that uh, is a, an Atom user, the takeaway should not be that you know I hate Atom or I think Atom is is too slow. I think that Atom just doesn't uh, lend well to the way I work, which is you know task switching very quickly, uh, everything from the keyboard, and I just want it responsive. Um, yeah. But. Uh, at the same time, you know, working with Sublime, Sublime kind of gave me that. I mean, Sublime still has one of the best fuzzy searches and, and results. Um, when you start to talk, you know, when, when you start to add more extensions, and, and you pointed this out with VS Code, right? If people want to bloat the, the software or whatever with a ton of extensions, you can, but you're going to get something lean out of the box. So you still have, you know, you still have the option to make it slow if you want to. But in terms of... Um, in although, terms although we try to really control that. So even if you do install a 10, we'll still try to make it fast. Yeah, but, right. And, and um, the, the reason I bring this up is because in Sublime Text, you can actually make it pretty slow and laggy. Like, you know, we're talking about Sublime Text, right? Built, uh, you know, C++ or whatever. Extremely fast. But the minute you start to add, you know, now well-written extensions that don't take advantage of Python's uh, multi-threading and whatever, like uh, the Git gutter or or Git extensions, it starts to slow down. So one of the things that uh, you know, w one of the things that I thought as soon as you know we saw you know I saw VS Code and tried it out is like how how different from Sublime or from Atom can it really be if it's built on the same stack, right? To some yeah. degree, aside from TypeScript. So um, I don't want to put you in the spot where you have to talk negatively about another editor, but I do want you to kind of give me that, you know, for those people that are really into Atom, and I know that there are a lot of people that, are, that have been considering uh, 
trying out VS Code, what are some of the differences and some some of the tangible uh, gains that they might get uh, from trying out VS Code? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and I'll start by just uh, agreeing with what you're saying too. I think every tool has its pros and its cons. Um, VS Code has really good things about it that I really like, and it has areas of improvement. I happen to work on the team, so I'm even more aware of the areas of improvement. Um, and we, especially on the VS Code team, we're very, we're big developer tool fans. So we like we like seeing innovations from Adam. We love seeing new things from, from Sublime Text. We, we feel like it's a pie and we just want to make the pie bigger. Everyone's going to be able to have um, a lot of, a lot of goodness here. So, so um, I think that what some of my efforts have been focused on, how can we help if, if there's a developer that uses Atom today or Sublime Text today, are there things that we can do that would make um, VS Code more appealing to them? Um, and I, I can give you some of those. So, so one of the things uh, we think is a strong point of VS Code is these features that we cherry pick from um, our our big brother, so to say, Visual Studio. <laughs> so we we can pull in um, because of some of our partnership teams and just uh, learnings we've had from working on Visual Studio for decades. Um, we can pull in a really good IntelliSense experience. So if you're using uh, TypeScript or JavaScript, right out of the box, you're going to be able to have at your fingertips the modules APIs. Um, now you can enable this in some of the other tools. Um, with with tools like TurnJS, which is a cool open source project, um, but in VS Code, it's out of the box, and and we think it's much better. Like we we work really closely with the teams on making sure, hey, this is giving accurate type information, the, the best we can figure out in in the wild west of JavaScript, um, and this is giving. Um, this is giving the most up-to-date module information as well. So you can fill, you, you, in, you require the Lodash module and then suddenly you can type underscore dot and see all of Lodash's um, uh, methods and see the documentation for that. That can lead to a really good developer experience. So IntelliSense is one point. The second point is uh, debugging. We think we have an exceptional debugging experience um, compared to other editors. Um, we think our debugging experiences will, will one day be more comparable to what you get in IDEs where you have to uh, load this big thing. We think that's one of the killer features with VS Code. You can set breakpoints, you can put conditions on those breakpoints, you can see a stack trace. It's really easy to set up. You set up your debugging in a configuration file, a JSON file that you can share among your team so everyone can be able to debug quickly especially when we work with JavaScript developers um, or other web, uh, web languages that are used often with web apps, um, we see just so much console.log debugging or print statement <laughs> debugging. Um, and, and that's, I mean, I still do that on smaller projects, right? But it's so good when you can, you can just stop the execution of the process, you can step in, you can observe, you can look at, you can inspect the variables, you can type in the debug console. That can be a really powerful experience. Um, and we think we enable that better than the other tools do. So when you think about this core, like what do I spend the most time doing? Well, I spend a lot of time editing code. So I'm writing code. That's where IntelliSense fits in. And then I spend a lot of time debugging. And that's where the debugger fits in. Um, and then we put in the version control system out of the box. So this is our Git. You can, you can easily view the diffs of files, um, commit and push to your uh, Git repository. Other tools, Sublime Text and Atom, um, have these experiences with packages you can install. Um, we think because we built this uh, in the product, we think it enabled a better, more streamlined experience. So we've actually been really happy with people we've heard from the community that are brand new to Git, find VS Code's Git features to be very intuitive and easy to understand. Um, and and then they can they can take their next steps to understand Git and version control even more. But we think we've been able to enable that well. So those are probably the three points: the the out of the box IntelliSense debugging and version control. Great. I would I, I think that um, you know what one of the things that I believe most of us look at when we're uh, looking to use a uh, an open especially an open source tool, right? That we don't really know like what's behind it in terms of marketplace. Uh, or support behind a given tool. 
uh, every once in a while, every three months, every three months, I try to pick up a new book or a new programming language and a new tool to check out. And this kind of keeps me that it keeps me away from like checking out the new thing as soon as it come out because it, it can be a, a waste of time, right? Uh, but in terms of like trying to find or trying to decide if something is right to introduce into my workflow, I'll usually think about okay. This thing seems stable. It seems like it's well maintained. It seems like it has a good direction. Um, what's you know the, the the next thing is what's the support in terms of extensibility, customization. You know, and we talked about customization, but extensibility. I think the extensions in the marketplace, uh, it's kind of a big thing. Um, it, I think it's a big thing to have, but because. Uh, uh, because Sublime Text and Atom already had it, maybe it isn't a, a ton of, uh, say, a differentiating factor. Yeah. But I think it's a great opportunity to something where where um, it could be expanded. So let me ask you this. Even though VS Code is a free tool um, and you call it a, will, a goodwill project for developers, um, do you ever, would you, have you or would you ever consider having a marketplace for extensions that are commercial so say as a as a, a vs code extension developer i could create an extension that adds significant va a significant value to a project and i could charge you know some money for it yeah that that's a good question it comes up um a, a every probably once a quarter or so wait someone will bring this up whether an internal team or an external team um asking what our plans are here we, we actually have um, been strongly in the position of we're not wanting to do that right now. Um, now, will we ever enable that? Uh, maybe. I, I, I really don't know. But as far as like the foreseeable future, we really are invested in this. We want to we provide really meaningful tools that give developers a, a great experience and gives us that, I mean, like I said earlier, the benefit to us is we get engaged more with the community. So we're really not um, into the commerce. And, and I know that there's a flip side to that too, is we can enable external developers to build extensions that they can make money off of. It just hasn't been part of our strategy at this point. Gotcha. And I mean, it makes sense. I think a lot of us, uh, I mean, the, the our editor, because it's such a personal thing, a lot of the times we want to build for it so that we can benefit from it. Um, and I think uh, at this time, anybody can start asking questions if you guys haven't um, either via the chat on YouTube or um, in the in the room's chat, Twitter, whatever. And I think that there is one. Uh, John, can you keep an eye on the chat for me? I think there's, yes. one, there's one more area that I wanted to touch base here quickly before we get into, into the questions. And that was, uh, can you tell us a little bit about... Um, um, the version of VS Code, uh, it's not like an early access preview. Uh, you have a specific name for it. What's it called? It's called the Insiders. The Insiders version of VS Code, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the Insiders version of VS Code is the daily build of VS Code. Um, it's what we use on a day-to-day -day basis to build the product. Um, so it builds out of the master branch. Okay. Um, it basically is you get features and bug fixes as soon as they're as soon as they're pushed to master. So, um, so yeah, that, that's your that's your uh, that's your nightly build equivalent, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, nightly build equivalent. That's yeah. that's uh, that's really cool. I, I I mean that. I kind of installed that back when when you guys were shipping out the experimental uh, colorization of the panel, um, yeah. Because I have this I have this obsession with the I don't know if you guys are familiar with the uh, pay light theme that came the the ship with Sublime Text some time ago, um, and and that's kind of like my like my my recent sort of obsession for my theme is like I want everything to have this really dark but you know almost like purplish tint to it. Um, and you got it wasn't available for the stable version of VS Code, but it was on the Insider Preview. So I downloaded that and got to yeah. Some it. some fun things that have happened is like someone will tell us about a bug on Twitter, um, and we'll fix it in like a couple hours, and then we'll tell them to go try it on Insiders, and they'll verify the bug fix and just can continue. So nice. that's that's a fun like really you can twist pretty fast. Now, most people are on the stable version of VS Code, which is fine. I mean, that's the version that goes through 
uh, a week of testing before we release it. Um, and it is more, more baked and like insiders, for example, you might see something one day and then we'll take it out because we didn't like it or it might be. so, so there's some, there's some, uh, uh, what's the, just some frothing there, things coming in and out. Um, but it, it's nice because the products run side by side. So you really should install both. Um, and then I use insiders day to day, but if there's ever, I don't know, very rarely has this happened, but sometimes I'll run into like a blocking bug and I will, it'll stop my work. I can just easily switch to the stable version of VS code. That's great. Um, one more, one more point to touch base and then we'll go right into questions. Um, PHP storm is a tool that I use on a daily basis as well. And, uh, you know, you and I have kind of chatted about that. Um, and what PHP storm, uh, uh, obviously, PHP Storm is a full, a fully fledged commercial product as an IDE, right? Yeah. So uh, obviously, VS Code isn't trying to be PHP Storm, but in a lot of ways, it it, it, it almost allows me to do uh, some things that I use uh, in PHP Storm the most because the reality is most IDEs give you a ton of power, a ton of control and a ton of cool features, but you spend like 90% of the time writing code and debugging, just like you said, right? And uh, I, I, it feels to me that VS Code gets me pretty far. And when I start my day with PHP Storm, I'll, I'll stick with PHP Storm. And when I need to like do something lighter, like I need to do some front end stuff and I don't have to touch the PHP code, uh, I'll go back to uh, VS Code. When I start my day with VS Code, most of the time I stay with it until there's something that I can do or that you know would be much easier done in PHP Storm. One of those would be like refactoring. Say I, you know, say I inherited a a, a project and I'm not really yeah. great with uh, the completion, or you know, I'm not I'm like I'm not as familiar with the code base. Uh, I'll 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 probably need a good completion. And uh, the point, I guess, the point that I'm trying to make is that while VS Code isn't trying to be an IDE and it's trying to stay focused and light, it is provide it, it is giving me as a PHP developer a lot of the tools that I find on on an editor. So when you when you're looking around for inspiration uh, of how to implement certain features or what features other editors are shipping with, do you ever look at IDEs besides Visual Studio to kind of figure out what might be useful? Yeah, that's a great question. And we absolutely do. Um, I mentioned we're big developer tools fans. Uh, walking around the office, you can see people using all sorts of different tools. IntelliJ's uh, suite of products would be a strong one that we um, love. They, they have many delightful features that they've built. We, we look at them as a market leader, someone that's done a good job for a lot of developers. So we absolutely want to see if, hey, maybe there's some things that we can learn from there, how they've approached uh, the developer experience and see if we can use either similar things in our product or at least just leverage the ideas um, to then see what will work best for our users. Fantastic. Uh, okay, so we've got a few minutes here. Maybe we can get some questions. John, were there any? Well, it was more, I think Chase had one that is more of, I think, a point rather than a question okay, sure. and but uh so i'll just kind of go over it um he's a uh, sublime text user and uh but uses uh vs code a lot as well and um the thing with sublime text he really likes how clean it is and and he kind of wishes some of the options to like hide buttons and uh divider bars and things like that were available in vs code just to make the uh you know, coding experience as clean as possible. Yeah, so. I, I'm also, I share that um, desire, Chase. Um, and I, I think I think you'll see more and more of that as time goes on. I, it's kind of in our, like, it follow these, like, uh, consistency principles, just not overwhelming people with a bunch of new options and things. We want to make sure we do it right. But I think over time, that's a trend. You'll see more and more customizations are going to be available. Okay. If, uh, if anybody, is, are there more questions, John? That's that's all we have right now. Okay. But, oh, as I said that, <laughs> <laughs> Jay pops in with one. Let's see. 
he loves how Jay, this is Jay talking to, uh, to everyone. Uh, he's just now getting into VS Code, loves how snappy everything is. Um, under the extensions, he sees our recommended extensions, which would be great so I don't have, so I don't have to fish around in uh, finding stuff. Um, I think I think that I use is... Adam, however, that I use with Adam. Oh, he doesn't. Sorry, I'm reading. <laughs> I, I got the as it's coming through. OK, I, go I'm... for it. But yeah, what what he's saying is that he's not seeing any extensions show up when he does recommended. Um, you know, we we haven't done a great right, there. It's on the, my list actually to think through this experience a little more. The idea here is um, based on the type of files you've opened, we'll recommend those extensions to you. So um, what you need to do, Jay, is open a JS file or a Python file or a PHP file or whatever you're using in your workspace and then try recommended extensions again. So we're gonna recommend extensions based on the type of files that you open. Just so, a simple algorithm, we just query the marketplace for those type of files. So that would be equivalent to a context-based suggestion then, right? Yeah, yeah, that seems right. Yeah, oh, that's really cool. Or, that's deep learning right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's really cool. So. I'm big on giving people the full picture, right? So we talked about what's great about VS Code, um, you know, what's great about the culture and the vision behind it. What are some of the pain points? What are what are some of the things that people complain about? What are some of the things that you're trying to improve? Yeah, I mean, performance is a big one that's always going to be on our uh, uh, as our most important pillar, probably. Um, and one thing, as a longtime Sublime Text user, that I want to see us do with VS Code is just make it snappier. Um, I, I think that there's more to do there. And you hit the nail on the head, Selvin, there with our, we're, we're dependent on the Electron platform, um, which makes it more difficult than what Sublime Text can do. I mean, we get advantages, right? Because we can write one code base for multiple platforms. Um, but we want to invest more in this. How can we enable more, better performance, um, really a snappier feel? I, I think that's a really important thing to us. Um, but the other ones we've talked about today are, are important to us as well. The customization. Um, we, we see a lot of people. Here, here's a third one. We see a lot of people that try VS Code one time and then they don't try it again. Um, they're, they're kind of, they, they download it. They, they dabble around for even just a few seconds and then they're out of, out of the product um, and we never see them again. And so we want to make it easier for people um, when they first get going to see the value of VS Code. Um, we see a lot of users that don't use um, debugging at all. They just they just use uh, VS Code like you would any other tool. And in our opinion, they're missing some of the value of the tool. So, And that's on us. We need to figure out how we can show them more value. That's, that's I raise my hand up there. I don't. I don't do the debugging. You know what's uh, what's interesting. Uh, what's interesting, uh, Wade, is that two weeks ago we had uh, Gary Hogan uh, on the show, and he is a, de a developer advocate for uh, PHP Storm, and uh, we weren't able to post uh, or publish the, the the video because the recording had corrupted uh, corrupted audio. But he showed us something really cool that. I was not aware of in PHP Storm, and I've been using PHP Storm pretty heavily for a long time. He, they have this thing where uh, I can't remember what it's called, but there's a menu option where you, 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 as a new user, you go in and you say, you know, learn PHP Storm, and what it does is that it opens a sample project. And the files are context aware. So basically, if you open a JS file, it'll tell you, you know, do you want to set up debugging or do you want to, you know, do this or do you want to add some libraries so that you can get automatic completion for Vue.js or whatever. Like, um, I mean, he talked through a few things there, but the idea is that it was a, a it was a sample project that was deeply integrated with the IDE to teach you what you might be able to take advantage of. Yeah, I that, thought it was pretty interesting. That's awesome. We, we, we have seen that in a few cases. Um, and I think that we, we, we definitely could learn from that. that. That might be something we look at doing in the future. We, we started with just having this welcome page, um, sure. just to see if that made any difference. We'll, we'll continue to do different experiments and just see what, what will help people. But I, I think that kind of, I, I think of it like a, your onboarding you get on your mobile <laughs> app. Right. Right. And, right. Uh, we we're we're thinking, man. Does it make sense to do that? Does it make sense right. to do almost like a training wheels version of VS Code? Like, 
turn on trainings will mode and then we'll like right. kind of teach you around. I, I don't know. We'll, we're, we're, we have ideas, but nothing concrete. Yeah, absolutely. So for people that are watching uh, either in the room or, or uh, watching this recording, um, are there some resources, you know, if they're thinking about, uh, if they're thinking about uh, trying out uh, VS code, where, uh, where could they find the documentation? Are there some uh, resources available? Um, yeah, um, code.visualstudio.com is our website. Um, and there's some things there that are helpful. In the top navigation, you can click docs. That'll take you to the documentation page. And that first homepage will have a list of a whole bunch of places that are good to get started with. Um, another link there that I'm, we just barely worked on is called community. And that community page is the ways to interact with us in the community, but also um, it has a list of um, high quality tutorial content um, made by people uh, on Pluralsight, on Udemy, just things that people have made. Not all of them cost money, but some of them are free, um, but just high quality content that we've curated ourselves um, that we would recommend to people. Um, in addition, in the documentation, there's intro, uh, a column, intro videos, just things to learn more about VS Code. You, you can listen to my voice on those because I, I do. Absolutely. I'll definitely update the uh, event page with some uh, links to those and some notes. Um, and I guess uh, the, the, the final thing about you know, this conversation is that how do I, as a community leader, uh, whether it's, you know, for craft CMS or PHP, those are kind of like my two loves, right? Like I, I'm heavily invested on those two areas. How do, how, how can I empower or encourage other people to, uh, you know, once you're used to, you know, once you started using VS Code daily, once you've uh, learned everything you need to, to customize it and to get it where you want it to be, uh, how you've been able to curate the extensions and install the extensions that you have. Because one feature that we didn't mention is that VS Code, unlike Atom or Sublime, actually has extension bundles, right? Which yeah, is, extension packs, we call uh, them. Extension yeah. packs, which is, kind of, I think it's kind of cool because um, when when I know some, when I suggest some, uh, VS Code um, to somebody, you know, try it out. The first thing is, okay, what, you know, how do I customize it? Number one. Number two, like, what can I use for PHP or for Craft CMS, which um, a lot of the times, you know, we haven't really done much for, for Craft CMS. There's like a couple of extensions. Um, and I wrote one myself. But I, I, I thought that even though I was able to kind of get away with the documentation that was there, I feel like there are probably some areas that might, made it, might make it a little difficult for somebody to write an extension. So, yeah, yeah. Lots of improvement we need to make there. So, um, but it, it's a lot easier, though, for like than a Python extension if you're not familiar with Python or uh, like a PHP Storm extension is such a hard thing to build. You know, you got to build it in Java and go through that process. So, um, is this something you would consider maybe improving the docs for, you know, the, you know, how to build an extension, maybe have a couple of uh, uh, extensions built. And, and, and another thing that I'm sorry for, for interrupting my own question, but I just remember that the, you know, you guys have a, a command line tool that essentially allows people to bring in their own themes and whatever from, from, from text made, right? Yeah. Maybe, maybe add a little bit on that. Yeah, I think uh, as far as the extension publishing, I, I think you'll see we're, we're, we're in the process of figuring out what are the pain points here. And I think in the next three months, you should expect a, a decent overhaul of the process to improve it. Um, we're, we're aware that there's a lot of pain points there. Um, that's something on the, the website documentation side we're really trying to invest in. Um, as far as the, what, what was the second question? Did you say something? Yeah, the uh, there was uh, VS Code ships with a command line tool that allows us to do kind of like uh, oh, yeah. you know taking a package from TextMate and bringing it into VS Code. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that. Those are all great. Like, what one thing you can think of is we wanted to enable with VS Code. Hey, you like working with the terminal? We're going to make it as easy as possible to work with the terminal. So that that was an important thing for us. Fantastic. Okay. Sorry. One thing that's in the in the chat that just since some people watching the video won't see the chat, uh, you're getting props for having a very good change log, a descriptive change log. So yeah, no, thanks. That's you. a good yeah, thing. So we did mention that at the start too. Just we spend a lot of time on that, so we appreciate. Okay. The good. Prop. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, 
Uh, I'm I'm really uh, one of the things uh, you know before um, before getting in touch with Wade, I, I watched a couple of his presentations on YouTube. Uh, those are really good, especially the one I think it's uh, is it the last editor you'll need? Well, it's it's uh, yeah. it's linked uh, it's linked on on the event page, uh, uh, craftx.io slash hangout slash the case for VS Code, um, and I, I suggest you guys kind of check that out. It's really cool. Um, so we've we've gone over a little bit, but I still want to throw a couple of quick fire questions at you. These are just random questions that I want to kind of get your response time on. Are you cool with it? Okay. Yeah. Um, so so number one, if you were an HTML, if you were markup, what HTML tag would you be? <laughs> um, man, I don't know. Come on, div. So I could be flexible. I don't Which know. Which one? Which div? I'd, div. I'd be the Oh, there come on. That's so boring, man. Come on. What about <laughs> you, John? Uh, figure, just because. I don't know why. I'm just picking it out of the thin air. Figure. 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 Yeah. Okay, so what... Go figure it out. What if you were... Oh, there's the guy, <laughs> there's the guy on, on chat. That Submit. Says, Submit. That's an awesome one. Man, that's, a, that's an awesome one. Okay, what if you were a programming language? Wait. Um, if I were a programming language... Visual Basic, I, man, Scott Scala. Scott, wow, Scala. okay. Yeah, I love Scott. the man. I got the 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 object oriented, the functional programming. I, I can do it. I like flexibility. So wow, that's what, yeah, that that that. Okay, what about you, John? Extended Basic from my Texas Instruments computer that I first uh, used. Wow, so, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's awesome. So, um, the the TI ninety nine four A. If anyone's wondering so okay cool cool final, <laughs> final final question and this one's just for wade um and 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 you can you can answer with no comment if you want but are you allowed to use a mac while working on vs code <laughs> i i'm on a mac right now oh! I, I a lot of us use macs on the team and it's actually a funny there's a fair amount of people at microsoft that use macs um we're fans of computers right so uh, we use tools for the jobs we need and especially on the vs code team if we're trying to engage with the community of mac and linux right. users we're going to use mac and linux that's so. fantastic i gotta applaud that for sure that's great right. so i want to thank everybody uh that made it into the room uh, especially you john thank you for helping me out uh, with the chat and for joining us um, Wade, it was a, a great pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much. Uh, everybody else watching online, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, any final words? No, thank you a lot for having me, Selvin. Best of luck to you and please stay in touch. Anyone wants to contact me, um, I'm on Twitter uh, at Wade Ryan underscore. So I'd be, love to interact with you more. Fantastic. All right. See you later, thank everyone. You. Have a good one. Right, thank you.